Welcome to the Arts Access Florida podcast. I'm your host, Brianna Jackson. Arts Access Florida is a comprehensive initiative designed to shine a spotlight on your neighborhood's diverse arts organizations. Each episode will highlight their programs and more importantly, amplify the voices of the people they impact. Conversations, community, and connections. That is value in engaging with your local arts organizations. Arts access equals arts access. Support for Arts Access Florida comes from the Community Foundation of Tampa Bay, championing philanthropy, encouraging and connecting givers to bring lasting good, investing in education and economic mobility. Learn more at cftampabay.org. In this episode of the Arts Access Florida podcast, we speak with three organizations that are working to incorporate the arts into education through many different forms. Each of these organizations provides students with a safe space to learn and develop their skills, all while participating in theatrical and choreographed productions. First, we are joined by three guests from the Florida Studio Theater, Caroline Salvador, Adam Ratner, and Josh Ford. The Florida Studio Theater helps children and young adults nurture their creative minds through participating in both performances and playwriting. Next, I spoke with Limus Balamos Wilmot from the Sarasota Contemporary Dance, who provides children K-12 with educational programs and works directly with local schools in Manatee County. And wrapping up this episode, Katie Welch and Amanda Shapiro from Broadway Everyday Star Theater joins us to discuss how their organization works with students of all ages to create an inclusive experience that allows them to dive into many different aspects of theater production. All right. Welcome, Caroline and Adam, to the Arts Access Florida podcast. How are you? Very well. Thank you. Yeah, we're both doing great. Thanks for having us. We're excited to learn about Write a Play with the Florida Studio Theater. It is a wonderful program, and we're so glad <laughs> that we get to share it with you. Tell us about the history of the Florida Studio Theater's Write a Play and how it became to be. This is actually kind of a, uh, a watershed year. It is our 30th uh, anniversary for the Write a Play program. Uh, it was launched in 1991. And it was actually started by Kate Alexander, who is our uh, associate director at large, as well as uh, Richard Hopkins, our producing artistic director, because they were looking for a new perspective on how young people see the world. Um, And there was a lot of plays that were that were coming out that were a little more stilted and they wanted to see what what are young people interested in? What are they writing about? And they took the um, the I guess I would say the path. Um, of treating these young playwrights just like they would treat any professional playwright. Uh, so we, we had a little saying here for a while, it's just shorter plays by shorter playwrights. And uh, it was an amazing, amazing, uh, it's been an amazing, amazing experience. You know, we, the, we, we start with a, it's a three-part program where students, they first uh, see a full production of a children's play. Uh, normally it would be here on our FSD campus, but uh, Caroline has done some amazing stuff to uh, adjust for the times we're living in. Um, and then the second part is our Playmakers program, which is uh, partially of uh, scripted and partial improv, where the students uh, get to see, so again, some winning plays that have won in the past of our, our program. And then the actors work with them both on stage and in classrooms to create plays on their own. They learn the four ingredients that we need for a play, which are character, conflict, setting, and dialogue. It's kind of like making a cake. You've got the right ingredients, you can make a play. Uh, After that, those plays are submitted to us. And one of my uh, fantastic jobs that I've been doing for many, many years is I get to go through all of these fantastic little works. Um, And uh, last year we received over 7,600 playwrights submitted. Uh, which was an incredible, incredible. And uh, in, in the 30 years that we have done the program, we've seen over a million children and uh, we impact about 47,000 students a year, which is it's just, it's, it's, it's amazing. Wow, I'm, I'm so taken back by the numbers. You said 7,600 playwrights were submitted. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. And, and we reached over a million students. 
And we in the in the in the history of the program, yes, we have reached over a million students since since starting in 1991. I think one of the great things about the program is when the students see the works written by their peers, is there's a real connectivity of seeing like they're feeling the same things that these other students that are are getting to display their plays on stage. Like are they there's there's a sense of wow, someone understands something that I'm going through or I feel that same way so it's a real it's real kind of empathetic response from young people which is you know is is amazing it sounds as though you're you're allowing them to use their voice and in return they're able to have someone listen absolutely that is one of the most important things is we do not want to restrict them from creating whatever they want to want to put on put on paper and share with us it takes a lot of courage we say to create it's uh we each we actually award each and every student who submits a play gets their own personalized certificate and there's a quote on there saying that um you know it's the ancient greeks used to award their their great warriors in battles and they also awarded their great poets and playwrights because it takes just as much courage to put your ideas and feelings out there as it does to go out there and, and risk your life. So we really, we really want to congratulate them for the, the great work. Right. And with the, the 7,600 that were submitted, how do you, what do you do with those? Do you make, do you select a certain amount to, um, bring these yes. plays to life. Okay. Yeah. Tell us more about oh, that. Yeah. There's, there's a, there's a great selection process and Caroline can definitely jump in on this as well, because she is in the trenches with us when we were selecting these plays. Um, each and every play is read at least twice by members of our staff here at Florida studio theater. And then uh, pre COVID, we also would have a certain day where, where we're donors and VIPs would come in and read the plays written by the students. And it's, you know, it's a, it's a shuffling process where, you know, the wheat from the chaff, as they say, and, and we whittle it down. We look for plays that, that have a, as we were talking about before, have a very uh, unique voice and are fun to put up on stage. And everything from silly things about pencils that are afraid to be sharpened to uh, children that are afraid that, um, that, they're, that their parents are getting a divorce. So it runs the whole whole gamut. Yeah, I just want to chime in on that too, Adam. We are selecting plays for both kindergarten through sixth grade. And then we also select plays for seventh grade through 12th grade. So we're looking for about a dozen plays in each category that are varied, right? We want to make sure that we're sharing as many different viewpoints and experiences and imaginations as possible. Um, and when you read the plays, all of them, I would say more than 90% have all of the ingredients that we've set forth of character setting, conflict, and dialogue, but you know a winning play when it just sets something inside of you on fire. You like see that little spark of creativity kind of jump off of the page, um, and everybody can feel it when they read it. It's something that just brings about like the wonder and truth of childhood. And some of them are long and complex. And by long, I mean five to eight pages. And some of them are very short, one page, but are able to tell a concise, important story just in one page. So there is no magic formula, but there is an emotional reaction to a piece of art that was created, even though it's created by a young person. And in your experience watching these these plays come to life, what type of reactions do you see from the students themselves that created this play? You know, it's almost that 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 wonder and awe, like, oh my goodness, they saw, they they put this on stage. This was just living inside of my head before, and now I'm seeing it right here in front of me. All these people are getting to share it. And it doesn't just make an impact on the child. One of the biggest days and most exciting days here are when we bring their classes, we bring their parents, we bring their teachers their brothers, their sisters, and they get to see the performance as well. And as proud as the child is, the, the parents or aunts or uncles or cousins or whoever's there with them, the way that they now look at that child is different. And getting to watch them watch the child watch the play is such a fantastic experience because they're now seeing either their classmate or student or child in a whole different way. And what's amazing about this is you're really encouraging just the power of using your imagination. And typically when we're in school, you know, it's very structured. You do your homework, you take your tests, you study for state exams. But at times, maybe we learn, we forget how to use our imagination. But your program is really igniting that in your students. All of the education programming here is going to highlight that. That's what we 
celebrate and want to grow in a child, right? Is that that sense of wonder and imagination. And we, we kind of operate with the Virginia Woolf quote of writing is an act of the imagination that the hand records. So first and foremost, it comes from your imagination and then we take it down and then we write it on a page. Along with Caroline and Adam, I also spoke to Josh Ford from the Florida Studio Theater. Josh went into a little bit more depth of how he goes about teaching theater to students. See, I run the education department here at Florida Studio Theater, and there are, are still preconceptions even in the education department uh, that, that we like to challenge. Uh, I think primarily, because uh, I work with a lot of youth, um, you know, we like to challenge the idea that, uh, that children don't make art or aren't artists or are haven't grown into being artists yet. Our artistic director, Richard Hopkins, said to us, don't think of them as pre-adults, you know, think of them as having their own culture. Think of them as like Shakespeare from Mars. And, and that's, uh, I thought that that was such a great idea. And it has been, it has formed my personal, one of my personal bedrocks about working uh, with young people and uh, is also obviously one of Florida Studio Theater's uh, bedrocks where we talk about that that's a, a preconception that we can really challenge and we can really make real art with young people or people who don't have artistic experience. Wow, I love I love that phrase, Shakespeare on Mars? Yeah, Shakespeare from Mars. From like Mars. There's just, yeah, like imagine that there's this whole other culture yeah. that exists that we just don't understand it yet. And I have found that to be true uh, every time that I, I work with young people, like uh, every every year it comes up, there's a whole new set of uh, language and uh, you mm -hmm. know symbology that they have with each other uh, mm -hmm. that I don't know anything about. <laughs> it has nothing to do with me, right? And so they have to right. teach me, you know, their language and this, and they have a culture of their own. Uh, and I'm a I'm a visitor in that <laughs> culture, you know. Do you have a a favorite play? Uh, that you remember that you'd want to share and what it was about? We did a play, uh, <laughs> it was written by a third grader and third graders are perfect as writers. They are, right. they're really amazing because they, they understand structure. You know, they've seen enough stories, they've watched enough TV that like they get it. They understand how plays work, beginning, middle and end, but still like anything can happen, you know? Uh, so this particular play uh, was about, uh, it's called The Dog and the Alien. And there's a dog in Central Park and he's sad because no one will play with him. Uh, and this alien lands in the middle of Central Park and he comes out of his spaceship and he says, tells the dog to uh, take me to your leader. And the dog just wants to play, so he just barks. And this happens a few times until finally the alien says, these earthlings must be stupid. And he gets in his, uh, gets in his flying saucer and he flies away. And the dog is sad because no one's playing with him. And I just thought it was, it's just a perfect play. It's like four minutes long and it's sad and it's funny and it's, it's just beautiful. Studio Theater not only educates young artists to better understand what theater is, but encourages students to really engage with the sense of wonder and imagination that helps them further expand their creative ideas. More information on the Florida Studio Theater can be found in our show notes. Welcome to the Arts Access Florida podcast. Thank you so much for being here. How are you today? I am good. Thank you for having me. Can you tell us a little bit about your role at the Sarasota Contemporary Dance? Yes, I am the proud founder um, and artistic director of Sarasota Contemporary Dance. Um, so I, you know, I've been part of, you know, helping it grow. I, I, Wore, I wear many hats. Um, I am a director. I am a choreographer. I perform every now and then. Um, I also teach and I help just with the artistic aspects of the organization. Um, and we now have our home in the Rosemary District, 
which has been really exciting. And we've been able to um, really just expand our programming and offering classes um, from children to through adults to seniors. Um, so that's been really exciting. <laughs> Awesome. And and speaking of school, uh, I see that the Sarasota Contemporary Dance has done so much for the local communities uh, with your programs for, for K through 12. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about what your program is? Yes. I mean, one of the things I love about Sarasota and Manatee, it's the arts, you know, in the schools and really supporting that. So we've been able to um, build curriculum that um, allows us to go into the schools. There's one that's a popular one called the triangle where we um, go in and we even did this actually um, through Zoom during this whole pandemic, but we we introduce, it's almost like a sampler or like if you're going through the cafeteria and you pick and choose, um, we did this kind of with dance. So each student would participate in like 20 minutes of contemporary dance, 20 minutes of creative dance, 20 minutes of jazz or Afro-modern or Afro-Cuban. And it's like a wheel. And they get like 20 minutes with each teaching artist and get a little um, embodied work. So they get to experience it. The teacher is presenting the, the dance style that maybe some of the students have never been you know, um, exposed to. And then at the very end, we do like a show and tell. So there's been phrase work that they learned in all those three 20 minute segments, and then we show it. So this idea of experiencing a dance style and then being able to share with each other, also being an audience and also being the dancer. Um, there's something about that that we can you know, teach about respect and, and supporting and witnessing and watching someone else do something, encouragement. So these all these social skills. Um, and, and the great thing about it is like, if you feel, oh, Afro-modern is what I feel most comfortable in doing and maybe like, you know, creative dance, I, I'm not as confident. You have an opportunity to try each one and really shine in, in the style or the approach that you really feel um, comfortable in. So we've done that. That has been like the most popular, the triangle. But we also have um, SCDE, which is Sarasota Contemporary Dance Ensemble. And that is our training dance company for aspiring dancers. And that's for, um, 12 and up. Um, and that has really taken off. Um, and that is something that's not necessarily in the schools, but we do get information out to the schools, um, primarily the high school schools in the area. And we've had, um, you know, Booker students, Northport High, um, high School students, Manatee School for the Arts um, come through and, and train with our professional dancers. And that's really been um, exciting to see because there's like now this legacy that we're leaving, you know, um, it's not just the professional dance company, but we're being, being, being able to be a, um, a place where people come to train for contemporary dance. Um, and we also have our summer program that we've had for kids for K, um, K through five as well. Um, and that we're able to bring back this summer, which is wonderful. That is, and, and tell us more about uh, how the pandemic had affected this program. Well, the pandemic with the K through 12 program, and even like I teach at New College as well, you know, everything went through Zoom. And I think people were surprised how dance can translate through like a Zoom process and how it can still be um, interactive. We, I think we, we had to shut down like first or second week of March. And I would say the week after we already had started um, transitioning to virtual classes. So as far as our studio programming, that that was a quick turnaround. And I think that's the beautiful thing of contemporary artists. We're used to having to think in the spot and be innovative. And, and so like that was a real fast process for us. Um, the schools, we getting the information out. I know that there was teachers having to navigate this whole new world that they had never experienced before. Um, and what we did is we um, recorded the series, the triangle. So there's a recorded um, that teachers can actually go to our website and purchase the triangle. And we did two different ones. We did one that we can actually um, come in on Zoom and, and it be interactive. And we have another one that's pre-recorded that if teachers only wanted to do like a 15 minute segment of let's say jazz, and then take a break and then do another day, do another 15 minute segment of 
um, Afro Modern, they can do that. Um, so we have those resources on our website. And that was something that came out of the pandemic was creating these resources that were um, good quality and, um, and get it to the hands of the teachers. So that's on our website. Um, and we, we tried it out with, um, with a class from University of Florida in Gainesville. Obviously those were college students, but it was really fun to, to try it out with them to make sure that it was, um, you know, the number of students on Zoom and those kind of logistics. And um, so I appreciate them partnering up with us for that. Well, congrats to you and your organization for thriving uh, using Zoom. Um, I love the idea that you're able to provide pre-recorded sessions and live sessions because that just shows you're you're making it accessible to everyone, which was so important uh, in 2020. Yes, and I think moving forward, um, you know, there is that conversation about accessibility and our our organization. We've worked with professional dancers um, that are. Um, considered disabled dancers. And um, that was that is a conversation that we've had of how like maintain um, our master classes and other programming accessible to someone that maybe is in a wheelchair or someone that um, is not able to get to the studio. Um, how do we continue to stay connected to, you know, the, those people in our community? Tell me more about dancers that are considered disabled. One of my best friends, um, in high school lost her leg. And um, so I was part of seeing her come back to dance, you know, and, and dance with a prosthetic leg and without. And we, um, and actually she's presenting, um, we're bringing her in, in December and she'll be showing work. So I've been, it's been something that I've experienced, something that I've been, um, it's been a close experience for me. Um, and so Stephanie has, I've worked with Stephanie and we've, you know, choreographed together. And then Dwayne Shuneman, which um, is the director of um, Revolution's Dance Company and has a youth company in Tampa called Rev Youth. And we've presented them actually now during the pandemic. They, they, had, they had not done anything this whole year. And we had them come to our studio. It was um, a closed event just with their parents. And we, we were able to get funding. So our studio now has these multi cameras and we have like a whole broadcasting system and we recorded their performance so they could live stream it and share it with their friends and family. Um, so that was really awesome. So, so we have this relationship um, with Dwayne. We also have had a longstanding relationship with Parkinson's Place. So we teach dance for Parkinson's on Thursday mornings. Um, and that's been... Um, a program that we've been involved for eight years now. So making dance accessible has been something that um, we've been doing for a long time, probably since the, you know, since the start of the company. Um, I've, I've set works on um, dancers, um, disabled dancers, um, as an artist, as an independent artist, but also with the company we've had invited guests that these are professional dancers. Mm -hmm. um, they just have a physical disability. You mentioned uh, the Dance for Parkinson's program. Can you uh, tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, that's on Thursdays at 10 a.m. It's at Parkinson's Place. It's um, a program that I helped start um, when Parkinson's Place approached me um, over eight years ago. I had just um, lost my mother-in-law um, to, to, um, um, to part, well, not necessarily to Parkinson's, but the challenges that happen when you have Parkinson's disease, um, you know, uh, the result of it. And, um, it was, I felt like it was totally a God thing, like to give back. Um, and I, and I did it for five years or four years, you know, um, and, and absolutely loved it. And then it became an integral part of the company. So we rotate through company members. Right now, Shenyang Dancing Girls leads the class. Um, it, it has an assistant and um, a live drummer. Um, I was really, um, I felt like music and dance um, was an integral part for this class. Like I didn't want just the movement. I really wanted the musical component as well and an assistant. So someone that's going around and actually doing tactile work. So actually physically touching the bodies of um, the people participating. And obviously with the pandemic, we haven't done that, um, but we are resuming to um, in-person classes, we hope in September. Um, and that program has been 
um, just wonderful to see evolve and, and see how different company members come in and out and, and get to experience and being part of that community. And I've also been able to um, connect New College of Florida and students that I teach to partner and do um, different events. So we've had performances with, Parkins, um, with our friends from Parkinson's Place and also students from New College of Florida together performing. Um, as well as with the company performing on stage. So it's been um, a real fruitful experience. And, and I love this also multi-generational aspect of it, which I think um, we don't realize when it's happening, but uh, what I like to share is that the Parkinson's, um, people living with Parkinson's and the ones that I have come into contact with are usually um, you know, my parents or my, you know, or grandparents, you know, they have, they have grandchildren that don't live here or they're far away from their children and their families. So being able to integrate the new college community, which these, these kids have are away from home and, and are away from their grandparents and stuff. So to integrate these two communities together and kind of fill that, that void, um, has been really beautiful to, to see those relationships that have evolved from those um, connections. It's great to learn that there are organizations catering to both school children and adults. Sarasota Contemporary Dance's K-12 programs allow students to engage with the fundamentals of dance both in and out of the classroom setting. Also, their Dance for Parkinson's program provides those living with this disease an opportunity to expand their physical capabilities. To learn more on how you or someone you know can get involved, please visit our show notes. Hi, Katie and Amanda. Thank you so much for joining us today on the Arts Access Florida podcast. How are you both? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for inviting us. What I love about your program is you've made it possible for teens, kids, and young, ad young adults to participate in theater productions. Tell me more about that, Katie. Well, the one thing that, I, I love community theaters, but the one thing that definitely has problems with uh, actors, including old and young, is that you're either in the show or you're not. It's either you audition, you're in the show, great, uh, well, you have to be in the show, or thank you, uh, thank you, but try again next time. I want a, a world of a community that allows kids, teens, and adults to be a part of something that they're auditioning and thank you, you're in the show no matter what. So yeah, we we don't we don't reject anyone at Broadway Everyday Star Theater. The one thing that I know a lot of, of actors and lesbians they they hate rejection, mm -hmm. and that's the one thing in our community theater we don't like rejection at all. So we try not to implement it. And what I also love about your program is that you offer your students an option to participate um, front and center in the theater, but also uh, behind the scenes for those who are not comfortable. So Amanda, tell us more about that. Well, we do. We also do have uh, people who want to perform up on stage, but then there's some people who feel a bit more comfortable working backstage or they're pretty good with editing so we do offer um other opportunities at the such as they might work tech backstage or they might run music mm -hmm. with us and recently we had we offered opportunities to edit some of our videos since the pandemic kind of hit us right. and we also like there's some people who want to learn like say like hey miss katie miss amanda i'm interested at directing that is can I direct so we we allow um all some of our actors if they want they can be your stage manager they can learn how to do lights and soundboard uh we even have one student who was not comfortable on stage at all so he was in charge of backstage the whole entire time and he loved it and now he's in college right now and he's studying being a stage manager that is an amazing full circle experience I love that <laughs> So it's good you you let them you let them choose where their comfort level is and if it's something sticks it sticks and if not they can always choose something else to perfect exactly like yeah. if they um, like we even had like one student who wants to learn about uh, media 
So one thing about our community theater is that we also do like video, uh, videography. And if one of our actors wants to learn about how to um, uh, do videos, we allow them to help us record our trailers to our show or behind the scenes features. And it's, uh, it's a really good opportunity for them. Yeah, and you not only offer, you know, the theater production aspect, but it's more of an education for them to learn these new skills. Yes, that's the one. Amanda and I are both teachers, so we got the feel of that. And it's really amazing to see how much growth our actors are from young to old. They continue to grow and and they love it so much that they want to come back and be part of a Broadway at Vinny Star Theater, or best for short. Uh, not only do our performers learn some things, um, Katie and I have been learning a lot as we've been working with Best. Um, like since the whole pandemic started, uh, Katie started doing music videos for like, uh, she started off with, I think, Tomorrow from Annie. And then we started getting into like this big virtual cabaret this past spring. And we... Yeah, we, we definitely saw some growth with our editing skills and even more with our recent um, video we just did for Eurovision too. Like Amanda was the one who found them and they started doing like some musical um, cabarets online. Then we were in the contest called Eurovision Musical Contest uh, number two. And we got, uh, so Broadway Everyday Star Theater registered. We got picked for one of the 13 contestants. Um, we got random, they randomly draw, uh, drew out a, con- a European country for us and we got the country of Denmark. Oh. So, uh, so the only two musicals that we knew that represented Denmark was Once Upon a Mattress and The Little Mermaid. So we had all our face, we had we post on Facebook a poll saying, which musical do you want Broadway Everyday Star Theater to represent and 95% said Little Mermaid. So we did a mashup to the Little Mermaid and we found out on Saturday on the uh, 19th, we came in third place. Out of 14, right Katie? Yeah, 14 countries. And, mo- and we were the only United States um, re- representing team to run in that. And it was all of uh, like, we had people like uh, who collaborated with us to be part of the music video with like um, the Philippines and um, Ireland and Canada. But yeah, uh, we were completely in shock that we came in third place. We thought we would not even get that close. So it was amazing. That is amazing. Congratulations. That's really big. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm not surprised that Little Mermaid was the top pick. <laughs> well, that yeah. Is, I that, love Little Mermaid. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people love that. We did like yeah. so we did mash up between Part of Your World and Under the Sea. Yeah, we did like a little poll to see like what song we wanted to do. And a lot of them said Under the Sea, Part of Your World came in a close second. And I just like, you know what? These two are very popular. Let's do a mashup of those two. Amanda is really good at editing. She um, made the, um, the sound of both, of both karaoke soundtracks to coexist and it sounded perfectly. Perfect. And Katie, this, this question's for you. So in the past with um, other organizations that I've been interviewing, um, a lot of their focuses have been on um, positively impacting like mental health. So how has mental health tied in uh, with your organization and what you do? Like I said before, we don't reject anyone. So we're all an inclusive theater. So anyone with teen, uh, kids, teens, adults who have disabilities, like my, my cousin, she is Down syndrome, but she is like the, the dancing captain of our shows because she's an amazing dancer we don't reject anyone and instead of like focusing on the negativity of like oh this person can't sing or this person can't dance we focus on the positive like what are they good at and like like I said my cousin she's an amazing dancer even though she's down syndrome we focus on her dancing skills we we just love it and and it's sad to see that some people can't uh, like they are pushed away because of a disability Mm-hmm. and it's just it's disappointing to see that uh, because of that barrier we uh, that they can't push through mm-hmm. and that's why I'm glad that the community theaters the arts program are allowing that to happen including our community theater so Amanda what are some different ways you've witnessed these performers and participants benefit from these experiences 
like anything in the art dump, it definitely shows some self-expression and definitely a lot of confidence. Um, we had one participant who started off in the virtual cabaret this past spring, and he has never done anything theater related before. And he thought he would give it a try. And his confidence are growing. Like he's getting, when we had our music rehearsals, he schemes to get more confident with the music. And he even turned up again during our Eurovision competition. And he definitely has, he definitely found this appreciation and his love for theater that he even like looks up some things about Broadway saying, oh, Jeremy Jordan has been, is coming back as Seymour in Little Shop of Horror. So he's definitely turned into a theater fan. So, <laughs> so stuff like that, where you see people just growing appreciation and a passion for theater and just developing this confidence in himself mm -hmm. to perform. Mm -hmm. But also just to see like their imagination and their characteristics. I remember there was this one girl in our murder mystery, A Town for Murder, which I wrote. I, I write plays. I write, um, um, I write musicals. I write plays. And we used one of my murder mystery plays for our, one of our very first shows. She was struggling at first because she could not, she says she could not connect with the character that she was playing. So we did a, like a little, um, like a little characterization game to see, uh, to see how they can connect. And one game we played was questioning the character. So we had her sit in a chair and she had to act like the character, but and we had to ask her questions. And one question I asked her is, why do you think your character is in this position right now? And her character, she, um, uh, spoiler alert, she was the murderer. She said, I believe my character did this is because she wants to be noticed. And everyone kept on doubting her, thinking like she can't solve, she can't solve anything, she can't be true to herself. So she, she, act, she accidentally killed the person because she wanted attention. And after that, she started, um, she started growing into her character. And she even texted me uh, two weeks ago. She said that she just got a lead in um, Oh To Kill Mockingbird. She got the lead in To Kill Mockingbird, and wow. and she said. It's because of the characterization questionnaire again that she got more knowledgeable of how to portray her character. Mm -hmm. Wow, and that's a skill she can take mm -hmm. in her acting career as well. Kind of like a role reversal and figuring out why the character is the way they are. That was a really cool um, scenario you put her in. Yeah, like uh, like I said, if it if we don't play like a lot of improv games or. Mm -hmm just to get to know your actors. That's the one thing directors need to do. Instead of just saying, okay, you're going to do this, you're going to do that. You need to get to know your actors. Mm -hmm. Like how, uh, how's uh, their day? Like what, uh, how they feel about the character? Because maybe they can't connect and connect mm -hmm. or they just don't know what to do. Right. So that's the one thing we do at best is try to connect or grow like one big family. Yes. And you and Amanda are giving them key essential skills Katie and Amanda, thank you so much for joining us today. And just thank you for what you're doing for these students in our community and enriching them with the, the love of theater. It really is impactful. And, and thank you for your time today. Yeah, and our motto is Broadway Everyday Star Theater, where everyone is a star. Arts organizations like Broadway Everyday Star Theater are truly making a difference when it comes to community participation. Allowing children from all walks of life to find their place within the theater really helps their creativity and gives them a sense of belonging. Be sure to check out our show notes for more information, including one of the most recent videos that was submitted to the Eurovision Music Contest this year. It's so exciting to see so many local programs that are right in our backyard, teaching people the value of getting involved with the arts. These organizations are truly paving the way for our next generation of artists. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode, and we look forward to having more inspiring conversations next time. I'm Brianna Jackson, and you have been listening to the Arts Access Florida podcast. This show is a product of WUSF Public Media with the help of our founding sponsor, the Community Foundation of Tampa Bay. Our show is produced by Aaliyah Moffitt, Chandler Balcom, and Leslie Laney. A special thanks to our editor, Scott Walkler, and our entire engineering team. 
You can find out more information, performances, and other content that our local arts groups are creating by following us on Facebook or Instagram and visiting our website, artsaccessflorida.org. That's arts, A-X-I-S-F-L.org. Copyright 2021, WUSF Public Media.